Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, now shift with me. Um, that's Isaiah. Fast forward 700-ish, maybe 740 years to the book of Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. You're going to notice a similarity here where it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Two instances, 700 years apart, same promise. Two different moments in history, two radically different social and political situations, two different audiences who are hearing these words, same promise. A lot changed in 700 plus years, same promise. I just want to encourage you today as we get started and we look at components of the Christmas story and the narrative around the, the arrival and the birth of Christ, that life changes and situations change and your problems probably change and your health will change and your financial situation might change and, and time will pass and relationships change and you and I will change even though um, I feel like the same guy that I was when I was 25, but that guy didn't have to put eye cream on at night to help deal with the bags, you know? <laughs> Um, it's a change. It's a change. Um, I was looking at, like, Natasha bought me this eye cream, um, and I went to put some on the other night because I was like, man, I do not look good. And uh, it's expired, so I don't know if that helps. And she was, she's quick to remind me that putting it on once every six months is not how that stuff works. It doesn't just, like, zap your skin back nice and tight. Um, we change. Uh, it's a much bigger decision now in my life to have a bowl of ice cream at 9 p.m. than it was, like, 10 years ago. If I have a bowl of ice cream at 9 p.m. now, I'm going to be working it off for 7 to 10 days. This is different. Things change. I got I to gotta stretch before I drive my car. Because if I shoulder check without stretching, I'll pull something. And then for the next week, I have to turn by using my whole upper body. Like, things change. You know it's true. Things change. And I just want to encourage you, if things have changed in your life, and that maybe has caused you to be unsettled, a little bit insecure, kind of wondering what's next. Know this, same God, same promise. The same God that was with you a decade ago, the same God that was with you 20, 25 years ago, the same God that was with you last month is with you today. He's the same God, same promise, and the encouragement from these two scriptures, 700 years apart, is behold, which is just like, look, don't miss it, see, pay attention. Pay attention. Emmanuel's coming, like God with you. Same God with you, with me in every situation. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are here. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, we thank you that we can live with confidence knowing that you are an ever-present help in time of trouble. God, we look to you again today. I ask that you speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is, uh, it's Advent season. Advent comes from the Latin Adventus, which simply means arrival, the arrival. It's a time when we prepare for the arrival of Christ. We celebrate his birth when, when God became man, put skin on humanity and divinity in one package. And, and, and so we prepare, we get ready. And um, uh, there really is no excuse in our current world, in our current climate, to not be ready for someone's arrival, right? Like, we've got every possible method of tracking people. Like, things that, things that like, 20 years ago were only government secrets, you now can do with your phone, right? And so, recently, I was, uh, I was flying back into Calgary, and so when you're, when you're getting ready for arrival, they, they come on the system and they let you know we're getting ready to make our approach to Calgary and there's some things you got to do and you got to put your seat back <clears throat> up and, you know, put the tray away and put your laptop away and somebody comes along the aisle and they collect all your garbage and they do all the things. And, and what I love about 2022 is that, like, now I know that if I don't put my phone on airplane mode, the plane is not going to crash. I know that now. <laughs> For a while, I was scared, and I thought, man, I could be the one. Yeah, I, I remember thinking, if I, if I turn this on airplane mode mid-flight, there's an indicator, and there's going to be like a, a, a law marshal on the plane who will come back and hog-tie me for turning my phone on. Now I get it. 
I don't know why they tell you to do it. And listen, maybe I don't want to hear why either. Like, if you know the answer, <clears throat> I'm looking at my friend Dave, who fixes airplanes for, for a living, and I can just imagine him saying, hey, man, that's actually really dangerous. You know what? I don't know. It's, I've never brought the plane down. I have yet to ground a plane by turning on my phone. And so as we're on approach, I always turn my phone on, <clears throat> and, uh, and now I can see, like, I'm... I'm over top of the air. We're coming down to the tarmac, getting ready to touch down. And I can look at my wife's location, and I can text her from the air and say, hey, it looks like you're still at home. <laughs> you know, like, do you know, like, you can go to a website right now, and you can track every minute of the flight. You can know every detail. It's not like you know when I leave and you're just guessing that the wind conditions are great and I land at the right time. No, no, no. You know exactly when I'm coming. You know exactly when. And so I'll text her. Be like, hey, I know you're about 27 minutes away from me. I'm about 30 seconds from the ground. How are things? And and then and then she's driving up Deerfoot, and I can see her, and all the kids, like, there's just no privacy. We all track each other all the time. And so <clears throat> she's driving, and the kids are like, hey, Mom, Dad's made his way through the airport. It looks like he's standing outside, and they're at Ikea. And, you know, <laughs> and there's, just, there's no good reason to not be there for me. Like, we, there's a... There are cell phone lots now where you can pull in. And I know it feels nice to scroll Instagram on your couch, but you can scroll from the front seat while you're waiting for me to text you that I'm here. The kids can watch Netflix in the car, and they can just pull around, and I'll be there. Instead, I'm like the guy with no family. I'm the guy with no friends. Everybody's watching. Multiple flights are leaving. We got, we got people are changing shift, and I'm still out there. The weather systems are changing, and I'm waiting for a ride. Sir, are you okay? Every taxi cab driver is like, man, I'm going to make some money off that guy. I'm like, no, my wife's coming. At some point, they're like, sure she is. <laughs> There's no reason for my ride not to be there. And then, of course, when, you actually, when she actually does pull up, there's no pleasantries, right? Not because I don't want to be pleasant, although it had crossed my mind, but um, because you can't, because they treat the arrival spot like an F1 uh, pit stop location. And so you can't get out of the vehicle and, like, hug someone because you're excited to see them. They don't even stop. They open the door. Get in! Get in! I throw my bag in. I jump. Because if you stall, there's somebody who's like, sir, keep it moving. Can't park here. I'm get like, I'm getting in the vehicle. We, we, should never, we should never be surprised by an arrival now. You share your location. We're tracking each other. Uh, it's interesting because, um, you know, we, we, we celebrate Advent, and we, we know that this season is preparation for the arrival of Christ, um, but he's already here, and, and we get that. And I just wonder sometimes if, if we, for all of our technology and all of the notice and the fact that it's been his birthday for a couple thousand years now, if we still get caught off guard. Like if maybe, maybe... Like, maybe Advent is an opportunity to kind of recalibrate us again to the importance and the significance, the magnitude of the arrival of Christ on the planet. Maybe, just maybe it's important that, that in this several-week period, we kind of get broken out of our regular routine and all the distractions and the chaos and the fun of, the, of our lives and the season and the things that we take on and just remind ourselves again, wait, 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 this is not about me. It's not even about family gatherings. It's not even about gifts. It's not even about buying the right things. It's not even just about charity. It's, no, no, no. It's about Jesus. It's a recalibration. Am I ready for his arrival? Am I ready to receive him again? Am I ready to, to, to be recalibrated and say, okay, God, it's, it's you. It's all about you. Jesus, my life can get full of so many things, but, but in Advent, it's got to be about you. You know, I, um, Natasha and I were away last week, but a couple of weeks ago uh, when I spoke on our Legacy Sunday and we concluded our series on Abraham, I, I ended the message running the genealogy of Christ from Matthew chapter 1. It starts with Abraham, ends with Jesus, and in between uh, goes from Abraham to David. There's 14 generations, then David to the Babylonian exiles, another 14 generations, then from the Babylonian exile to the arrival of Christ, another 14 generations, 42 generations in all. Each one waiting and hoping 
that a promised Messiah would come to lead people to freedom. Over and over and over again, new men are born, new men grow, but not one of them is the promised deliverer. Not one of them can reflect God's nature perfectly. Not one of them can live up to the standard that, that, that God had set. Not one of them can lead people to true freedom from oppression. Not, not one of them. Now, there were glimmers of hope. David was a good guy. He had a good run. There's Josiah. Hezekiah had some good moments. Solomon has, you know, there's, there are glimmers of hope, but even, even the heroes that would get celebrated from generation to generation, not one of them could keep God's standard. Not one of them could keep God's law. They all sinned. They were all broken. They all had issues. Every man, woman, and child born in 42 generations was imperfect. They would try to make commitments like, God, we're committed to you. We're committed to your ways, but to no avail, they would ultimately fail and, and fall flat and and so it's been 42 generations, and now, um, even over the last 400 years, by the time we turn the page to the book of Matthew chapter 1, the last 400 years have been the most, have been the most difficult of this whole time, because God's gone silent, divine silence. No record of God speaking through a prophet, no recorded miracles, no prophetic dreams, no cameo appearances of Jesus in the Old Testament, just waiting Everybody waiting for an elusive promise, a mysterious Messiah, a birth that had been foretold but was being withheld. And into that sort of setting and stage, you have Joseph. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Um, to, to be betrothed is um, a very serious and significant marriage commitment. It's not being married, but it's also not being engaged. You know, like, um, engagement's great. If you're engaged, man, we, we celebrate you. But all you have to do to not be engaged is take your ring off and go out with somebody else. That's it, really. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, but when you're betrothed, I don't suggest you do that. <laughs> I'm not encouraging that. But I am saying you're fair game. Uh, but... When you're betrothed, you actually have to go through, somebody just like squeezed the fiance's hand, I'll kill you. I will kill you with my bare hands. <laughs> but when you're betrothed, you would actually have to apply and file for divorce to end the relationship. And so uh, Mary and Joseph would have had this betrothal ceremony and they would have exchanged vows. And then from, from the time they would exchange vows, there'd be about a year span where they're just, they're just preparing for marriage. And so Mary would go her way with her girls and, and her family and would do all the, all the you know, the last, the last vacation with her family and, and spend a lot of time deciding who's going to do her hair and, and, and uh, um, the dress shopping and whatever. She's doing all that stuff. And Joseph would go and he's building a home and he's building a life and he's got to have something safe and secure that, that Mary can actually step into when they finally get married. It's a big deal. Um, there's, again, we, <laughs> there's, there's a couple things. I love weddings. I love celebrating love with people. There are a couple things that are really terrible, like speeches. Come on. Do we, do we have to do? Can, they, can you just write a card? Or if you're going to do speeches, do them while we're eating so we can eat and kind of pay attention because it's not for the guests anyways. It's not beautiful to me. I don't really care about the old stories. Tell them to yourselves. I'm just, can't, I'm, hey, hey, I brought you a gift. Don't make me sit through the speeches. That's one thing. You could just, or, or at least let me sit through them while I'm eating. That's, that would help. Um, the, other, the other thing about weddings that can be difficult sometimes is the time between the ceremony and the reception. You got this gap, right? I'm, somebody just was like, yes. So I know I'm not alone. And, you know, especially in Calgary, you go out, everyone wants to get married in the mountains. You go to the mountains and the wedding ceremony is from like 11 to 11.22 and all of a sudden they're married. Then it's seven hours of pictures and the reception doesn't start till six. And what do you do out there for, you can only sit in Starbucks for so long. You're just waiting. Well, that's, that's got nothing on this year that Mary and Joseph would have to wait. And, and, and the way it would end is, and this is kind of unfair to the bride, but, but basically, she's got to be, like, nonstop ready. 
And, and so she's always got to be prepared because whenever the guy's done building and all this stuff, he can just roll up and knock on the door and be like, hey, it's go time. And then all of a sudden, it's time for a wedding. And, and so, so the surprise is generally the brides because the husband shows up and says, okay, surprise, the house is ready, let's do this. Um, but in this particular situation, the surprise was Joseph's because they're betrothed, they go their own ways. In that span... An angel appears to Mary, says, hey, Mary, what's up? You're going to be pregnant. Uh, God's the dad. Holy Spirit's kind of a thing. And your first one ever, I know it's a little bit weird. And she's like, oh, my gosh, this is so weird. I need to go talk to somebody. And she doesn't think to talk to Joseph. She goes to her relative Elizabeth's house, and she hangs out for the first trimester, which is great for Joseph because all the morning sickness and all of that happens at a relative's house and not Joseph's house. So really, it's a blessing in disguise. But now, it's been a few months since he's seen her, and she rolls up, and it's, it just says that she was found to be with child. Like, just, Surprise! Like, he just discovers this. How did he discover it? Was he tracking her on Instagram? Did he notice she's starting to like some birth, some birth accounts on Instagram? Was he looking in her purse and saw, like, a pamphlet for Nazareth's best midwives? <laughs> Maybe it was his mom. Every woman I've ever talked to about this claims to have a keen sense of awareness when other women are pregnant. Like, you can sniff it out in each other, you know? I don't know exactly how it works, but I know that every time somebody goes public saying that they're pregnant, the next thing that comes out of my wife's mouth is, I knew. <laughs> I, I knew. I could totally tell. I knew like three weeks ago. <laughs> I knew they're like, how did you know? Well, I could, there's something about her face and she was glowing and there's just this, there's a vibe and her ankles and I just, <laughs> I knew that she was pregnant for sure. Now, I have yet for her to tell me she knows and then the announcement to come. It's always announcement and then I knew. <laughs> but maybe, so maybe it was Joseph's mom who's like, hey man, you need to go talk to Mary. Something's off. Whatever the case, one way or another, Joseph finds out that she's pregnant. And it's, it's an unbelievable thing. It truly is. We, we believe it because we've just heard it. It's been a couple thousand years of us like, oh, virgin birth, amazing. No, it's unbelievable. Joseph has to come to terms with the fact that the woman he's committed to marry, the one that he's building a life for, the one he imagined a future with, the one that he wants to grow old with, and no, no, this, this girl tells him she's pregnant And that is the Holy Spirit. And he's supposed to just believe it like it's nothing? Oh, yeah, great. That's amazing. Wow, I can't believe I get to be the father of the Messiah. I'm so excited, Mary. Let's go pick out a nursery. No, 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 no. It doesn't happen like that. There's doubt. He wants to get out of it. And and I think sometimes if we, we just quickly read over stories like the Christmas story, we don't take enough time to pause and acknowledge the doubt and the frustration in the middle of these miracle accounts because the truth is that there, there is doubt in every miracle. And, and I, it, I would be mistaken if I got up here and we championed the faith that it took for Joseph to be obedient and didn't stop and point out the doubt that he would have had in the process. And so don't get fooled into thinking that if I'm going to be a Christian, I can't doubt. And because I doubt, I'm a bad Christian. Doubt is a necessary part of faith. You would not be able to take a step of faith just by nature of what faith is if there wasn't doubt involved in the process. You're not the only person who considers the miracle working potential of God in your life and thinks, yeah, right. How's that ever going to happen? Oh, yeah, maybe Maybe for somebody else, but definitely not for me. No, you're not the only one who doubts. We all doubt, and you can be a person of faith and still be a person who doubts. And Joseph knew the details. She didn't lie. She didn't hold anything back. She said, Joe, I'm pregnant. It's the Holy Spirit. He knew the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and there's still doubt. And we can know the truth of God's word, and the truth of his promises, and the truth of what he says about us, and the truth of his miracle working power, you can know these things and still doubt. In fact, I would say you will know these things and will still doubt. 
It's a guarantee. You can know the truth, and the truth is a lot to handle. And so there's doubt, there's shock, there's anger, frustration, betrayal, confusion. It says in verse 19, after her husband Joseph, being just a man, being a just man rather, and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Verse 23 is really the focus. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel. Like I mentioned at the beginning, 700 years earlier, the prophet Isaiah said the same thing. Now, there are only two times in Scripture where this promise is given using this language. Then we can't just write that off as some sort of coincidence or a nice throw-in by Matthew, the author of this particular account. We have to stop and recognize for a minute that this is more than just a parallel verse. There must be a parallel context within which this promise was necessary. There was something about the wrestling that was happening in Joseph that the angel thought, you know what Joseph needs right now to help him overcome his doubt and fear and hopelessness? What he needs right now is the same promise that a group of people needed 700 years ago that Isaiah brought forward. Well, why? Well, if we review the context of Isaiah, I think we'll understand Joseph a little bit better. Very rarely do we actually connect what Joseph is going through with what the people were going through 700 years earlier, but it's important so that we can see ourselves in this story. 700 years earlier, um, Isaiah brings this prophecy to a king named Ahaz. Uh, King Ahaz was the king of Judah, At the time, Israel was a divided nation. So there was a northern kingdom of Israel, and there was a southern kingdom of Judah. For years, the northern kingdom of Israel had been attacking the southern kingdom of Judah and had actually recruited the nation of Aram to help in in the siege of Judah. Now, Ahaz, on a personal note, was a terrible guy. He was a terrible king. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He modeled what had been the pattern of Israelites over and over and over, that there would be a commitment made to God, but an inability to keep that commitment, and then a desire to do his own thing his own way. Not only was he just a terrible person, 2 Kings tells us more about his story, lets us know that he had given himself over completely to wickedness, that he worshiped idols, he worshiped pagan gods so, so much as to get to the point where he sacrificed his own son in a worship ceremony to the god Molech. He's a terrible, evil person. Now he finds out that like after year over year over year of being besieged and attacked by the northern kingdom and their alliance with Aram, he decides instead of taking an option which was presented to him to trust God for a way out, he thinks, I'm going to do this myself. And so he hires out the support of the Assyrian army. And so he starts paying money to the Assyrians to come and be be a source of defense and protection and safety for them against the attack from the north. And so that works for a little while and creates a false sense of safety. But, But the truth is, because he rejected God and decided to take things into his own hands, any sense of safety and security he had was going to be short lived. Eventually, what happened? was it got really expensive to keep paying the Assyrians to protect them. And the Assyrians started to notice, hey, we've got a pretty good gig here. Our armies are keeping these people safe. We can probably charge more money. So they upped the ante and wanted more in exchange for their services, and and Judah and King Ahaz could not pay. And this is a picture and model of what happens when we sin, is that we, we step into an alliance or relationship with something that we assume will make us feel better. And it might for a season. We might feel safe for a season. We might feel satisfied for a season. We might feel better or even protected for a season. But what feels good is not always good for you. 
And ultimately what happens is the price of that safety and what, they went, what he went to for safety was about to be the cause of his destruction. And the same thing happens for us that what we go to for safety, what we go to to feel better about ourselves, if it's not God, will end in destruction. And so Ahaz is surrounded and things are hopeless. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere else to turn. He's made the decision not to trust God. And, and he, but, but even with his lack of faith and lack of commitment and his rejection of who God is, God in his grace still prophesied, prophesied through Isaiah that there will be a virgin who will give birth to a son and his name will be Emmanuel and God will be with you even in your rebellion. And what a promise. Now we see here what really is the striking parallel in these passages. Because Joseph, of course, is not a wicked man. Joseph is a righteous man. But, but hopeless situations are going to come for everybody. Hopeless situations are just not the lot of the wicked or the evil or those who reject God. Hopelessness and moments of hopelessness are the lot of every person who's sucking air on the planet. We will encounter moments that feel hopeless. And so here's Joseph and... and and, and, and he's not immune to hopeless moments just because he's been a righteous man. We are not immune to hopeless moments because we come to church. We are not immune to hopeless moments because you have some healthy habits. No, no, no. It, it can come for anybody at any time. And, and the parallel is that King Ahaz, as a macro picture of the nation of Israel, over and over and over again, made a commitment saying, we will do what God wants us to do. But when things got complicated and hopeless, they broke off the commitment and did what they wanted. Joseph, 700 years later, has made a commitment to Mary saying, I will do this with Mary. This is the commitment I'm making. But as soon as things got hopeless, started to strategize a way to break off the commitment and take things and into his own hands. So it's a macro picture, then a micro picture, but also a present picture. Because it's the same thing we do. It's, it's the same process we have. We, we make commitments. God, I'm in. God, I'm going to do my best. God, church felt great today. I'm going to serve you. And then things get hopeless and things get confusing. And all of a sudden, we start to, well, we start to want to take things into our own hands again and wonder why every time I take things into my own hands, does it end up worse? It's a pattern over and over and over again. Joseph sees no way forward. He's it, it, it's hopeless. He's invested his life into a relationship that on the surface, uh, there is no reciprocity. There's nothing coming in return. And, and again, because we have the whole picture, we know that's not true. But in the moment, Joseph has been building a life for Mary. And now he's got to deal with the fact that she's pregnant. And it's so unbelievable of course he thinks that she's cheated. Of course he assumes that he's been betrayed. Of course he thinks that, that there's no love coming the other way because if she really loved him, how could she possibly be pregnant and what's going on? Of course he thinks that she's gone behind his back. And, and so his options are, I'm going to trust God in what seems ridiculous, makes no sense will make me the ridicule of everyone around me because they know Mary's pregnant and I'm the last to find out and they know it's not me and, it's, and, and if it is him, it's going to tarnish his reputation. Like, like I'm either going to trust God and look the fool or I'm going to take things into my own hands and I'm going to do what's rational I'm going to do what's logical. I'm going to do what makes sense. I'm going to save a little bit of dignity and I'm going to divorce, divorce her quietly and she can be somebody else's problem. And, and we get faced with the same decisions. We find ourselves in the same situation. I can choose faith that God can do impossible things and God will, will bring me into illogical situations where trusting him makes absolutely no sense. I can, I can make the decision to have faith. Or, because it doesn't make sense, I can make the decision to do what's logical and acceptable I can choose a lifestyle that's easier to explain to my coworkers, my family. I, I, I don't have to take a big chance. Oh, so so we, we live in this tension of faith and doubt and, and 
choosing to live in our own strength. It's the pattern of human existence. Maybe, maybe today you would be where Joseph is. Maybe you'd be where Ahaz is, where he's, he's he, maybe you don't have a relationship with God today and, and you, you rolled up in church with some family, but it feels like you're surrounded getting blasted from all sides. Maybe you do have a relationship with God and you're like Joseph and you just feel like, man, I just keep coming up on hopeless situations. I just keep coming up. You know, you've given everything into a relationship. You've invested and you've invested and you've invested and it, and it feels like you can never do enough for them to actually love you back. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you're in a spot where it's like, man, I've done everything I know how to do to raise my kids and I'm doing my very best, but it just seems like there's no respect and there's no love in return and, and there's tension in our home. Feels hopeless. Maybe, maybe it's a hopeless situation with finances where, hey, we can't get our spending under control and we've struggled to have discipline and we've made commitments to, to be better for our family, but then we've broken the commitments and it's, it's this credit card and that credit card and this line of credit. It's just out of control. It's hopeless. Maybe it's hopeless. Something to do with your health. And, and it's, man, we've prayed and we've tried and you're just coming up against it and it feels hopeless. Joseph feels hopeless. Ahaz felt hopeless. We can identify with hopelessness. Hopeless is to be without hope. Nothing to look forward to. No silver lining. No chance of redemption. No way out. Completely stuck. There are, there are signs and symptoms of hopelessness. If we're doing a quick personal inventory, what might that look like? Um, disorientation is a sign that you might be dealing with some hopelessness. Like, it just feels like your world is spinning. I'm, I'm too big now, thank God, that in my 40s, nobody's picked me up in a long time and spun me around to the point where I'm dizzy. That'd be so weird. Um, probably assault, actually. Uh, but when your kids are little, that's, just, that's quality entertainment, <laughs> You just pick them up, and you, you're spinning them around, and then you drop them down, you just watch them stumble into furniture. It's great. Uh, yesterday, one of my kids said, Dad, if you do this, you, you lose 25 brain cells every time you shake your head. I'm like, wow, I'm surprised you guys have anything left. It's amazing. <laughs> but, but hopelessness will make you feel disoriented. Like, I don't know how to get out of this situation. I don't know how I'm going to get through this situation. It's just confusing. I don't even know where to start. Um, you might be able to look at somebody else's situation and give them really clear direction. This is exactly what you should do to get out of where you are, but you can't help yourself. Maybe, um, maybe the symptom of hopelessness that you would see in your life is just drift. We, we drift from who we are. We drift from who God created us to be. We drift from the convictions we once held. We drift... From, from the plans that we once pursued, we just start to drift like God has called you and created you. And there was a moment where you're on fire and you're ready, but you've taken your foot off the gas and you're just starting to drift. And we, we drift, um, not all drift is equal, so we drift for different reasons. Some people drift because they're led astray and things get hopeless. And when things get hopeless, you, it's easy to get caught up in different waves of thought and ideologies. And, and, and we've seen that over the last couple of years as, as, as there, there's a lot of counter narratives to Christianity and counter narratives to the truth of the Bible. And it's really easy when you're feeling hopeless and a little disoriented to start to drift, to follow something that doesn't make sense and doesn't line up with Scripture and doesn't line up with your purpose. But you drift, you're led astray. Sometimes people drift intentionally. They walk away. We've been hurt. We've been offended. We get upset. Man, I can't believe that I got treated like that. I can't believe that happened to me. We get disappointed by people, and we think, man, um, that it's not just that person that's the problem. Church is the problem. It's not just church is the problem. God is the problem. You get, you get offended at a person, but then ultimately you start getting offended at God. Maybe you're just upset at God because he didn't answer a prayer the way you wanted it answered. He didn't give you direction the way you wanted, you wanted to receive it. And you start to drift. I don't have time for this. I'm going to take my safety my satisfaction into my own hands. Isaiah 53, 6 says, we all like sheep have gone astray. We're drifters, whether we like it or not. Maybe the sign or symptom of hopelessness is, is despair. It's this stage of, of hopelessness where um, you get to the point where you're just straight up, like full on, I, I give up. I'm going to throw in the towel. I'm sick of trying. I'm sick of the situation. I'm sick of trying to make it through these moments and and. And, and what's crazy about hopelessness is it's not, it's not something that we can avoid. It's inevitable. Even if you're not there right now, it comes for you. And we have in our world right now an epidemic of hopelessness. 
There's hopelessness everywhere. It's suffocating. It's overwhelming. It's, it's so, there's, su- there's such a void of hope right now that, and, and I, I say this with, with all sensitivity, and, and, um, but, but I want to paint a picture for where the world is at. And Do you know that medically assisted suicide, and again, this is not a commentary on suicide, but I want to just help us understand, grasp the scope of hopelessness in our current culture. I'm not talking, I'm not talking uh, like there's a whole other world of suicide. I'm talking medically assisted suicide in Canada in 2016. uh, Just over a thousand, believe believe us, a thousand and sixty-eight people chose medically assisted death in 2016. Do you know that in 2021 that number was 10,766? Again, not a commentary on suicide but a reflection of hopelessness. That's hopeless. One in 30 deaths in our country last year were medically assisted suicides. Somebody got to the end of the rope and said, hey, I have so much despair that I have nothing left to live for. And I'm not trying to put myself in anybody's situation. And I don't understand what it is to live with chronic pain. I don't understand what it is to be kicked out of a residence without the finances to be able to pay. And I, 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 don't, I don't understand all of that. But it's at a point where our country as a nation doesn't even want to offer hope. We want to op- offer an end. And people are taking the option. And what's crazy about a room like this is that some of you, some of you gasp at hearing that. And there are others who are looking at me and thinking, I get it. I thought about it. Do you know in Quebec right now, they're trying to lower the age of consent for medically assisted death to 14. 14. You can't even pick out your clothes at 14. Are we giving people the power to make a decision like this? 14. In March of this year, the qualifications for medically assisted death changed from physical illness to mental health. So, like, think about this. You could be 18 and get dumped and be heartbroken and in a moment of weakness think, I have to end it. And somebody will do it for you and pick up the tab in our country. There's hope. It's not that empty. It's not that bleak. And I don't pretend to know every situation, but we serve a God who showed up in our weakest moments and said, I will be God with you when it hurts, and I'll be God with you when there's no answer, and I'll be God with you when there's no healing, and I'll be God with you when there's not another option, and we don't have to just receive hope. We have to dispense it. There's hope. There's hope. And so into the the brokenness of Ahaz's world, the prophecy comes, there's hope. Into Joseph's world, it comes, there's hope. Into our world, the arrival, we have to carry the message that there's hope. And listen, if you're here and you're on the brink, we'll do something. Let us know. We'll do anything. And there's an opportunity for the church to step up in our world right now and help lead some 10,000 people to life in Christ over the next year to help save them from eternity. Apart from him. Hope comes through a virgin, Mary. Why is that important? Because Exodus tells us that the sins of the father get passed on from generation to generation. And so Jesus couldn't have an earthly father because he was going to be born without sin. And so we take comfort in placing our hope in Christ because he was born and God was the father. It was the seed of the Holy Spirit. And so we know he's perfect divinity. But he's also fully man. Knows what it is to struggle, knows what it is to hurt, knows what it is to be disappointed, knows what it is to feel fear, knows what it is to have disbelief, knows, understands. And so in his divinity, I see everything I aspire because there's eternity in the heart of every person that's longing for more. 
in his humanity, I see what I can touch and reach out to and what knows me and can identify with me. And the promise was that he would come to save us, to save, to be rescued from death, danger, disease, hurt. When Jesus came, when it said in Matthew chapter 1 that he came to save the people from their sins, it took any political notion that Joseph might have had and put it away to the, put it to the side. Jesus is not a political instrument that we use to try and get our own way. It's, he's, not, he's, he's, he's really not that concerned with what's happening politically. He's more concerned with what's happening spiritually. And the real issue we need saving from is not an agenda in politics. It's not something in culture. It's sin in my own life. He came so we could have hope, but hope, I, I don't want to make it sound like hope is easy. Like, hey, well, I know life is hard, but just hope. Hope is hard. It's hard to hope. G.K. Chesterton, theologian, says this, Hope is the power of being cheerful in circumstances which we know to be desperate. It is true that there is a state of hope which belongs to bright prospects in the morning, but that is not the virtue of hope. The virtue of hope exists only in earthquake and eclipse. For practical purposes, it is at the hopeless moment that we require the hopeful man. And the virtue either does not exist at all or begins to exist at that moment. Exactly at the instant when hope ceases to be reasonable, it begins to be useful. Listen, I know we can look forward to a warmer day and a sunrise, but there's a hope that goes beyond the weather and how we feel. There is hope that is a virtue, and right now it's desperately needed in our world, and we are the men and women who can step up and say, hey, we'll be the hopeful man. I'll be the hopeful woman. We'll be the people, and we'll have hope when it seems to be impossible. Hope is hard. Joseph woke from his sleep as he did the angel the Lord commanded him and he, and he took his wife but knew her not. You don't think it was difficult for Joseph to be obedient? He just gets up the next day and felt like everything is going to be all right? No, of course not. We don't see any explanation Would have been amazing if they could jump on Jerry Springer the next day. Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. And somebody does a paternity test, and they come out, and they'd be like, yeah, Joe, it's just Mary's and God, I guess. That would have been easy, but but even though he didn't feel like it, he was still obedient. All Joseph had to go on was a dream. That could have been some expired hummus for all he knew. That's what he's got to go on. And what showed up as hurt, Joe, I'm pregnant. That hurts to hear that. Was going to show itself to be hope over time. What showed up as disappointment, Joe, I'm pregnant. He'd be crushed. Was going to show itself to be divine over time. And I just want to encourage you, what might show up as hurt, what might show up as disappointment, what might feel like frustration could be. It says, it says um, all this took place to fulfill what the prophet foretold. What if all of this, what if everything you've experienced is taking place to fulfill what God ultimately wants to accomplish in your life? If 700 years of frustration was setting the stage for the promised Messiah, then 10, 20, 30 years, a week of waiting for a prayer to be answered, all of this could be part of God getting ready to do something divine in my world, but hope is hard. It's not always obvious. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. It's an anchor. Our hope is an anchor. And when you drop the anchor of hope, in the storms of life, into the sea that you would live in. It's got to get through some stuff to get down to the rock, doesn't it? Well, the anchor might have to get through some pollution and garbage that's floating on the surface, some things that we've allowed into the mix that should never have been there. But the anchor is heavy enough to get through the garbage. The anchor might have to get through some vegetation and seaweed and growth that's come up, but, but it's, it's heavy enough it'll get through. Because hope has to work hard. It's not easy. you got to do the work. The anchor might have to get through some wreckage. 
a broken relationship, a, a laundry list of mistakes that, that otherwise we would think is disqualifying us from having hope in the future. But, but listen, the anchor can get through the wreckage. And every anchor has to pass through the dark. Every anchor has to pass through the unknown. Every anchor has to go through a time and a space where you can't see what's coming and you don't know what ahead, lies ahead. But it is the hard work of hope. And if your hope would work hard, it'll eventually come and catch on a firm foundation. And that is the rock of Jesus Christ. Listen, hope is found under the surface. So when my emotions are on the surface, I got to get deeper to find my hope. When what I can see makes no sense, I got to get deeper to find my hope. When the diagnosis is on the surface, I got to get deeper to find hope. Jesus did not show up in obvious fashion. On the surface, he was a baby born to a poor couple in the backside of a barn outside of Bethlehem. But under the surface, he was a king. He was a king wrapped in cloth but clothed in majesty. Under the surface, the infinite was found in the infant. So normal that you would miss him if you weren't looking. But if you get under the surface, there's hope. And so in this Advent season, I want to call you with me under the surface under the surface of what you feel and under the surface of what you see and help connect you again to hope that you can trust. Hope that your life matters. Hope that tomorrow can be a better day. Hope that God is with you no matter what.